Okay, hello everyone. Uh, actually, I, I do apologize for delay of uh, this session and also probably it will be preceded by recording. Uh, we are living in uncertain world, if you, you see. So, my name is Ji Young Kim. Uh, I'm working as a Institute for Unification Education in the Ministry of Unification. It is my pleasure to join to this Korea Global Forum for Peace 2020. I hope this session contributed to construction of the peace on the Korean Peninsula. In this session, we're going to discuss about UN sanctions against North Korea and denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. I will moderate this session with the key speaker, uh, Professor Thomas Biersteker. Uh, hello, uh, Professor Biersteker. It's my honor to discuss with you for this session. Before we start to have our uh, key speaker's presentation, please let me introduce Professor Thomas Biersteker. Um, Professor Biersteker is working at the Department of International Security and Conflict Studies and Director for Policy Research at the Graduate Institute of International and Developmental Studies, Geneva. And Professor Biersteker is author and editor of 10 books, including State Sovereignty as a Social Construct in 1996, The Emergency of a Private Authority in Global Governance, 2002, and the, the last one is Target Sanction, the Impact and the Effectiveness of UN Actions, 2016, which is uh, related to our topic today. He published on global governance, international organizations, and on institutional mechanism of global governance in the UN systems. For the operation of this session, I will probably give 40 minutes for your lecture and have a Q&A session in the remaining time. Uh, probably in the previous plan, probably uh, the audience who are watching this session, they're gonna leave some question, but uh, because of a technical problem, I'm gonna raise some questions to your lectures. Uh, so please welcome Professor Thomas Biersteker. Right, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you <clears throat> for that introduction. Uh, and uh, as well as thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak uh, to you today. I'm sorry that we can't have this conversation uh, in person, but these are, of course, uh, unusual times. So uh, let me proceed uh, directly to my presentation. And uh, I think if I can load it here. We all have to get accustomed to uh, unusual times and unusual reliance on technology, but hopefully this, uh, mm -hmm. this will be clear. So what I'd like to do is, is speak uh, with you about the idea of linking sanctions relief to denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. And I'd like to give you a sense of the outline of what I'd like to, to cover with you this afternoon. First, uh, I'll talk a little bit about international sanctions. Um, it's, a, it's a subject that most people uh, sanction. Most people don't like sanctions. I'll say more about that and why. Uh, but I'd like to proceed from there to talk in particular about the, the, the nature of the UN Security Sanctions, uh, UN Security Council sanctions currently on, on the DPRK, particularly their relatively exceptional nature with regard to other UN sanctions activities. And I'll say something about the U.S. Uh, maximum pressure approach that has been taken uh, by the Trump administration in recent years. I'll, I'll continue with a brief reference to, it's very significant. I'm not departing from it because of its lack of significance, but I'll mention the unintended consequences of the sanctions. Uh, and then I'll refer to some recent research I've conducted with colleagues at the UN University and at Swiss Peace on the relationship between sanctions and mediation, and be, I'm doing that because it has implications for discussions about sanctions and negotiation. I'll continue by giving you a typology that I've developed of different types of sanctions relief, and then I'll continue with uh, with the more detailed uh, slides discussing the relationship between sanctions relief and denuclearization, and a few comments on prospects for the future. So there's a lot to cover, but I'll try to do it in a clear and and fairly concise manner. So we have some time for uh, at least a discussion with, with our moderator. So let me, let me proceed from there. First, <clears throat> international sanctions. Well, everybody 
nobody likes sanctions, actually. I study sanctions. I find them infinitely fascinating. Uh, but I wouldn't say I normatively like the idea of applying these kinds of restrictive measures for different ends. Uh, and the reason people don't like sanctions is, is in part because they interfere with trade, they interfere with finance, they interfere with, with the indiv individual's right to travel and to have free movement. Uh, and they also frequently are associated with negative humanitarian consequences, not necessarily because of the design of the sanctions, but often because of their over implementation. Another reason people don't like sanctions is because uh, in frequent cases, there are violations. One of the innovations of sanctions in the last 20 years has been the introduction of individual targeting, targeting of individuals or corporate entities. Uh, but that oftentimes raises serious questions about the due process rights of individuals and whether or not the idea of sanctioning someone uh, doesn't really give them uh, fair notification, access, hearing, effective remedy in cases. So there are a whole series of reasons why people don't like sanctions. And then most people say, well, they don't work, do they? Why, why do we employ sanctions? The, it, it turns out when you look carefully uh, at different sanctions regimes and look carefully at the different episodes of sanctions regimes, we find there are occasions when they are in fact effective, either in coercing a change in behavior, constraining an actor or sending an effective normative signal, but they're not overwhelmingly effective. And, and that's certainly our, our research results don't show that they're any more effective than most of the other studies that have been conducted on them. But they're increasingly used, sanctions are increasingly used by states by regional organizations uh, and by international organizations. And I think one of the main reasons for this is that oftentimes from the standpoint of a policy practitioner, sanctions are the best option given the alternatives. The alternatives of simply saying we disagree with this policy or practice or an escalation that leads to the application of, or the use of, of force, threats or use of force. So given the alternative, we often find organizations and states are turning to the application of sanctions. Now, I mentioned at the outset that the DPRK sanctions are exceptional, and I'd like to put this in, in a comparative perspective for you. First, uh, the DPRK sanctions are without question the most extensive United Nations sanctions regime in place today. In fact, they're approximating comprehensive measures. We, we sometimes hear uh, people say, well, they are comprehensive. They're actually technically not comprehensive. But as you'll see in a moment, when I gave you the list of different types of restrictions being applied, you will see there's very little that is not being sanctioned. So they're approximating, but not equivalent to a comprehensive trade and, and financial embargo on the country. Uh, the reason I say they're approximating comprehensive measures is because there are three very broad, and, and we call them non-discriminating measures, uh, the restrictions on finance, petroleum, not just petroleum, but all petroleum-related products, and the transportation restrictions. And we call these non-discriminating because they're, while they're sectorally targeted, these are sectors that affect the entire population, either directly or indirectly. And so that's why uh, these measures uh, are likely to have very, very broad effects throughout the, the, the economy and throughout the country as a whole. In our, some of our most recent research, we've been looking at how discriminating are different sanctions regimes by their design. And uh, when we've done, uh, we've developed a scale, of course, it's a thing social scientists do, uh, scholars do develop a scale to <clears throat> talk about how discriminating are different UN sanctions. Um, we have a scale where one is extremely targeted just on individuals, in some cases, four individuals in the case of Sudan or eight in the case of Mali. Uh, to the other end of the continuum, a number six, which would mean basically comprehensive trade and financial embargo. We think that the DPRK sanctions are at level five on this six point scale at this point. In fact, 14 of the 15 UN sanctions regime are between one and three on this scale. The average is 2.3. The DPRK sanctions are at level five. And in addition to this, the UN sanctions are accompanied by EU and US autonomous measures. So you have a, a very, very broad sanctions regime in place in the DPRK. And this next slide will give you a comparative perspective, putting the DPRK sanctions in comparative perspective. I know the print is rather small, so it's rather difficult to, 
see all the details on the scale. But if you think of the blue and purple and green as being at the low end of the scale, one, one through three, uh, and the red, orange, and yellow being at the high end of the scale, red being comprehensive, you can see in comparative respect and perspective of the 15 ongoing UN sanctions regimes, virtually all of them are between one and three in the exceptional case is the DPRK. You can see it moving from purple to green to yellow to now orange and, and approximating comprehensive measures, just to put the, the sanctions in a comparative perspective uh, from the standpoint of UN sanctions regimes. Now, sanctions regimes evolve over time, which is why we, in the previous slide, you can see we look at segments of time. Each one of those represents uh, a set or type of sanctions being applied. And in the case of the DPRK, we've seen an evolution from initial set of sanctions that were largely related to weapons of mass destruction. This is the set of sanctions applied between 2006 and 2012. Uh, and the one exception to that, of course, would be the, the sanctions on luxury goods and items, but that's largely focused on the WMD program. Between 2013 and 2015, however, financial sanctions and transportation-related sanctions were introduced. Now, some of these were conditional measures where they weren't a blanket ban or restriction, but they were conditioned if you had reason to suspect there was a transportation of prohibited items and goods, you were not just authorized, but you were required to board, seize, confiscate the material. So that's a fairly significant increase in the second phase. Uh, broad sectoral measures were introduced in 2016, and these were directly in response to uh, the detonation of, of nuclear weapons by North Korea during this period. Uh, this is also when the petroleum imports were, were added to the list, coal export, exports, one of the major uh, foreign exchange sources for North Korea were added to the list. And from 2017, you have all of the above, plus restrictions on fishing, remittances from foreign workers. So you have a significant increase over time in the, in the number of, of, uh, of sectors being affected, uh, sectors of activity, not just economic sectors, but also others, as I'll say in a moment. So the scope of the current measures against North Korea include first individual sanctions, these are usually in our category one of fairly targeted, fairly discriminating. In the case of DPRK, we have sanctions on 80 individuals, 75 corporate entities, mostly firms or um, departments of government, 66 vessels with more recommended by the panel of experts, the UN's appointed, the Security Council's appointed panel of experts. So we have quite a few individual sanctions in comparative terms, uh, but there are also non economic sanctions in place. There are sanctions on diplomatic activities, sanctions on arms imports and arms exports. Uh, I mentioned already uh, restrictions on luxury goods and of course on nuclear materials. Then there are the sectoral sanctions I mentioned, fishing, labor, textiles, coal, non-discriminating sanctions, finance, oil, and transportation. So by the time you look at this list, it's a fairly, fairly broad regime. The only thing that's really left out, one of the more, more striking things is, is tourism, but then that requires a certain degree of financing. It is actually very difficult. And now, of course, in the, in the days of, of COVID, it's, uh, it's, the country has imposed an embargo on itself in a sense and, and closed itself off for understandable reasons. So even that sector is no longer viable. So that gives you a sense of the scope of the measures and how exceptional they actually are. Now, <clears throat> in comparative perspective, one, one question is why, why focus on the UN sanctions? Why are UN sanctions uh, so important? And here, I think it's uh, important to, to look comparatively. Um, the, the DPRK regime is very different from the Iran sanctions regime because in Iran, uh, the U.S. sanctions predominated. Uh, there's no question it's the U.S. Uh, unilateral sanctions. Uh, and certainly once it left the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action in 2018, uh, and then began applying new, new autonomous measures or, or unilateral sanctions on Iran, uh, that is really the central, the central focus. Uh, U.N. sanctions uh, are important in the case of DPRK because at least until the last couple of years, uh, they were implemented relatively uh, significantly by both Russia and China, and, and China in particular, given the fact that it's, it's the most important trading partner for, for North Korea, is, is quite a significant uh, actor and player in all of this. And, and uh, those of us looking at this case look in detail at the degree of implementation by China. 
uh, that becomes a very significant factor in terms of gauging the consequences or impacts or effectiveness of the measures. Uh, the U.S. also, because of its um, somewhat unique uh, bilateral negotiation at the very highest level during the Trump administration, is not applying the kind of extraterritorial pressure over the DPRK on financial institutions outside the U.S. jurisdiction. It's done this in the case of Iran quite, uh, quite uh, almost spectacularly in the case, at least from the perspective of uh, financial institutions operating from Europe. But this has not <clears throat> been the case uh, in DPRK, at least not up to this point. But uh, it's applied what, what it, it describes as maximum pressure. <clears throat> and I will argue later that I think this particular strategy may have reached its limits. Uh, and, and the reason for that is because over the past two years, there's been an erosion of consensus at the United Nations Security Council. And both Russia and China are, 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 are even in, in last December, crafted a, a resolution that provided some sanctions relief for DPRK. Uh, so it's clear that, that some of the major powers are, are that the consensus has broken down and the US maximum pressure therefore I think has reached certain limits. Now, that being said, so this is why uh, UN sanctions, relatively speaking, are so important in, in this particular context. The US maximum pressure approach has some distinctive characteristics and it's one of the things that makes the sanctions even broader in impact uh, than their design. Now, the first point I want to emphasize here is that in the period of 2016, 2017, the US was actually the co-pen holder with China. And holding the pen is significant because if you hold the pen, that means you draft the initial version of the Security Council resolution. And the power of the pen holder, I oftentimes hold up my pen when I emphasize this, the power of the pen holder is you can put things in the resolution that legitimize subsequent actions that you take unilaterally. And uh, the fact is from our <clears throat> comparative research on, on UN sanctions, we found that three countries hold the pen on about 90% of UN targeted sanctions, the United States, France, and the UK. So the so-called P3 are frequently the pen holders. The unique case, however, in, in the case of DPRK was that the US was the joint or co-pen holder with China in the construction of the key resolutions that really rapidly expanded the sanctions in 2016 and 2017. Now the US <clears throat> also frequently will apply what it calls additional measures. These are unilateral sanctions that go beyond the UN restrictions. And by doing this, uh, and by claiming the extraterritorial jurisdiction of US unilateral measures, means that the US will engage in the application of secondary sanctions, which can involve uh, substantial fines, heavy fines for, for firms that violate it. So this means that the US, in, in part, it's in a unique position. Uh, the world is still basically the reserve currency of choice is the US dollar. Access to the US correspondent banking system is absolutely essential for financial institutions globally. And as a result, what happens is the fear of secondary sanctions from the US and the application in the past of heavy fines, one against uh, Bay and Pay Paribas in France, uh, over $9 billion in fines. Uh, that makes the financial sector quite nervous and they engage in what we call financial de-risking. That means they're basically deciding this transaction involves North Korea. It's too, it's too risky for us. We're not going to engage in any transaction. So internally, even though they're not forced to sanction, banks will engage in a de-risking activity that in fact creates uh, what, it, what has in fact resulted in the DPRK being cut off virtually from formal international banking system in its entirety. Excuse me a second. <clears throat> so that's <clears throat> That's the addition of not only broad sanctions, but the combination of, of those sanctions with the U.S. maximum pressure approach and why the U.S. is uniquely able to apply, basically extend its unilateral measures on a global scale. Now, this <clears throat> undoubtedly results in, in unintended, undesirable humanitarian, very broad humanitarian effects. In fact, there have been recent calls, even at the highest levels from the U.N. Secretary General, uh, it, to talk about the importance of easing sanctions in some ways to address the, the, the challenges of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, 
that sanctions, first of all, let me just say, are not the only source of these broader humanitarian effects. They're, they're, they contribute, of course, they exacerbate, but they often exacerbate other policy practices that pre-exist. So it's easy to blame sanctions. Everybody loves to hate sanctions, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, but they oftentimes uh, are not designed in a way that are intended to create this. Uh, in fact, the whole idea of moving toward targeted sanctions in the early 2000s was the idea that you would actually minimize the unintended humanitarian effects that were so broad in the case of comprehensive sanctions in the case of Iraq in the 1990s. But of course, if you're dealing with a highly controlled command economy with built-in inef inefficiencies, uh, there are other problems and the sanctions simply exacerbate other practices. I have, there have been serious reports of, of a food crisis uh, within, within the DPRK, uh, significant challenges in uh, access to fertilizer and, and to continued crop production. Uh, there, of course, is the COVID-19 pandemic, which is affecting everyone in the world, but in fact, potentially could be uh, very, very dramatic within the DPRK. Uh, and we found that there are challenges even for UN agencies operating in the DPRK. In fact, there's been some recent creative thinking <clears throat> on the part of members of the UN Secretariat to try to come up with ways of at least getting cash into the country for the operations of UN relief agencies. But again, the access to formal banking channels being virtually cut off means that people are resorting to things like cash courier systems, which are have their own risks and, and consequences. So this is, is uh, these are not arguably not, not intended humanitarian effects, but we have to acknowledge that the sanctions exacerbate other practices and that in fact, the situation is, is quite serious in the country. <coughs> Excuse me, that being said, um, I want to talk about the potential of UN sanctions. And that may seem like a paradox, actually. Um, how can we talk about sanctions as being a, a potential uh, for a conflict resolution rather than, than the main source of the problem? And here I want to sort of turn sanctions on their head a bit. They, they're typically considered by many as punishments. Uh, but those of us who work on sanctions actually say, well, actually, they're not they can be perceived that way, but they're intended to be preventive measures. They're intended to, to prevent uh, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. They're intended to uh, prevent the ongoing conflicts in different places. They're an attempt to try to uh, constrain actors from engaging in certain kinds of prescribed activities. So they're, they're, they're not just punishments, they're typically preventive measures. And another typical comment about sanctions is that uh, they're, they're not giving room for negotiation and diplomacy. But in our research on sanctions, what we found or that sanctions exist between words and war, something I mentioned at the outset, but we've found in our comparative research on UN sanctions that the sanctions are never the only instrument being applied. They're never used in isolation. Sanctions are always combined with other measures, most often with negotiation most often with negotiation or mediation. So we find that in 90, 94% of the cases, sanctions are being applied while negotiations and mediation are underway. So it's not a choice of talking or applying sanctions. Uh, in fact, they're typically being applied in the same environment by the same, by the same actors. So there may be UN, or, or in this case, and of course, in the case of, of uh, the Korean Peninsula, or the six party talks, so nor in negotiations involving uh, major concerned states in the region and globally. So as a result of this, a couple of years ago, I began a project with some colleagues from the UN University, uh, the Center for Policy Research, uh, previously based in Tokyo, but now in, in New York. And we started what we called the Sanctions and Mediation Project, uh, the SMP project. And what we did was um, looked at the relationship between UN sanctions and um, the UN negotiations and the UN sponsored negotiations. Uh, and, and we found a mix uh, in terms of the, the consequences, and I'll say about, more about that in a moment. But one of the, of the findings from this work, although we're focused on mediation, which is, of course, a third party uh, neutral accepted by both parties, but we found there are implications for the DPRK, US, Republic of Korea, ongoing sets of bilateral and multilateral negotiations, because, of course, they're negotiations have been between DPRK, the Republic of Korea, as well as between DPRK and the US. Now, typically, <clears throat> in this research, we found that mediators want to stay away from sanctions. 
Uh, they distance themselves. They say it will interfere with our impartiality between the two parties. Um, we not want to avoid association with punishments, coercive instruments. And so mediators are even advised by the mediation support unit to, in a sense, uh, be cautious, uh, keep your distance from, from the application of these restrictive coercive measures. Uh, and sanctions can indeed complicate. We found a classic case in 2015 in the case of Yemen where the very day that a UN mediator reached an agreement between the Hadi government and the Houthis, uh, the UN Security Council applied sanctions on the Houthis on one side of the conflict. And, it, and the, the negotiations, the, the interim settlement fell apart, and of course the war is ongoing to this day. So there's no question that sanctions can complicate mediation efforts. But we've also found situations and cases where sanctions can complement negotiations and mediation efforts. And uh, if used in a certain judicious way, uh, and in a way that actually enables um, the mediator to, to get a quick decision from the Security Council, which isn't always possible, uh, there are ways in which sanctions can actually be used as, um, one might describe it as, uh, I don't want to quite use the word coercive diplomacy, but they can be used, and the threats of sanctions can be quite effective in certain phases of mediation or negotiation. And so we produced this report a couple of years ago, and that, actually, just a year ago, actually, uh, in February 2019, called UN Sanctions and Mediation, Establishing Evidence to Inform Practice. And there are my co-authors there with me on this project. And it's out of that project that I've been thinking about the use of sanctions relief for not just mediation efforts, but for negotiations. And this, of course, has relevance uh, for the situation on the Korean Peninsula. So what I want to do is talk about <clears throat> not applying more sanctions, not applying maximum pressure, but relieving sanctions, but using sanctions relief as an instrument, as a, as a productive policy instrument. Because in the past, <clears throat> and from our comparative work, both in the sanctions and mediation project and the work we've done uh, historically on, on UN sanctions, we found examples when the suspension of sanction, not the lifting, just the temporary suspension or the promise of additional exemptions can actually break deadlocks in negotiations. For example, uh, Libya in the 1990s, um, the Libyan government uh, was accused of, of uh, state sponsorship of terrorism. There were uh, two jetliners brought down, a Pan Am flight over Scotland, a UTA flight over Niger. Uh, and Part of the deal to get the turning over of suspects for prosecution in a trial in, in a Scottish court in The Hague, um, the deal was a suspension of the sanctions on Libya, particularly the oil-related sanctions on Libya. So we found that the, the sanctions weren't lifted until 2003, but the suspension took place in the late 1990s. And the suspension was on the release of the suspects for criminal trial and prosecution and an outside court. In the case of the former Yugoslavia, <clears throat> former President Milosevic agreed to go to Dayton, Ohio, where the agreement uh, that, that really resolved the core parts of the conflict, not all of the conflict, uh, the Dayton Agreement, um, the deal was uh, a suspension of the US oil embargo on Serbia and Montenegro. So again, suspension of an existing sanction triggered that led to Milosevic's agreement to go to Dayton, and eventually we had the Dayton Accords. Afghanistan, we've seen Gomar uh, Hekmatyar uh, and his breaking with the Taliban based on the promise that uh, he could be delisted. There's an individual uh, and uh, in his, his, his group, a corporate entity, um, who were formally delisted by the UN, um, now recognize the Afghan government as legitimate, broke with the Taliban. So again, a case where the promise, he, he wasn't delisted. It was simply, if you do the following things, recognize the government, we will take you off the list. And then finally, and quite significantly, um, Iran with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, Program of Action, which despite its challenges, of course, which are many and many today, um, it's unquestionable that Iran was motivated to see an end of the United Nations sanctions regime. It's, it's technically, I would argue, uh, still under a form of UN restrictive measures but it's not part of the UN architecture on sanctions. So that, in fact, that was a very key component, the whole idea of the multi-stage uh, lifting of different types of sanctions over time built into the agreement. Again, sanctions relief 
is what made, I think, the JCPOA possible. So sanctions aren't just always an impediment, but they're a potential tool for conflict resolution. And this is now where I want to take the argument to apply it more directly to the Korean Peninsula. UN sanctions are targeted, so use them, use them. You can ratchet them up as you have historically, but you can also ratchet them back down. So when I think about <clears throat> sanctions um, and bargaining, sanctions are not an end in themselves. And sometimes policy practitioners lose sight of this fact, but, but the sanctions are not uh, an end in and of themselves. They're, they're a tool that, that should be used in pursuit of some larger purpose. And in fact, they're more effective oftentimes as a bargaining instrument than as a tool of pressure. Sanction suspensions can be more effective than the initial imposition of sanctions themselves. So the idea that you, you're sub suspending them may give you more leverage than actually threatening to apply more. Uh, suspension carries also a, power, a powerful symbolic value. And it was very clear in the case of Iran that this was a very powerful motivator. Iran wanted to get off the UN sanctions list. And so I would say, <clears throat> and think of employing a calibrated tit-for-tat strategy. You do this, we'll do this, you do this, you do that. Uh, and, and try to think it through uh, as much in advance as possible, but one, of course, has to remain flexible in the application. So calibrated sanctions relief for tangible denuclearization measures. And that's basically uh, my broad proposal. But let me go beyond that into some, giving some detail. And uh, <clears throat> begin by suggesting there are many different types of sanctions relief that can be applied in a conflict situation. And I'll start, at, I'll give you a continuum since I, again, I think in, in uh, analytical terms about these issues. Um, the first thing that can be done is not the lifting of sanctions. The lifting of sanctions is way down the scale. Before you even think about lifting sanctions, you can voluntarily relax the implementation of the non-binding measures. So for example, the US could simply say, um, we're not going to pursue maximum pressure any longer. Uh, we're not going to pursue financial institutions. Uh, uh, we're not going to extend our unilateral measure. Some kind of voluntary relaxation. Um, and it could come from multiple sources. That's the first thing that, that can be done. The second, you may have measures in place, but you could add exemptions. Uh, why not introduce uh, a series of COVID-19 exemptions? Just make that uniform across the global system. We're facing a global challenge, a global pandemic. We're all facing it in all countries. Any country that's outside of, 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 the, uh, of the efforts to try to control the pandemic is, is a threat to every other country. Uh, so there's no reason why you couldn't simply create a set of humanitarian exemptions linked to COVID-19 uh, and add those and just include them across the board. Uh, DPRK is unique in sanctions regimes because it's introduced caps. Now, frequently when there's a sectoral sanction, you ban everything in the sector, all petroleum, all coal. But notice in the DPRK case, there are caps. You can import a certain amount of petroleum up to a, up to a certain amount. You can export a certain amount of coal up to a certain amount. So if you have the caps in place, adjust them. You could move them up. You could allow more petroleum for a period of time. Again, these are forms of sanctions. It's not the elimination or lifting of the measures. It's adjusting the restrictions themselves. Or if you have a sectoral prohibition, um, simply introduce caps. So let's say uh, on foreign workers and the remittances coming from foreign workers, introduce caps in terms of how many foreign workers are allowed. Uh, so not to prohibit them outright as was done um, technically at the end of last year, uh, but in fact, introduce uh, caps to these sectoral prohibitions, another form of, of relief or adjustment. You can suspend measures. Um, <clears throat> here's where lifting is, is sort of the last stage, and I mentioned already in the case of Libya in the 19, late 1990s, 98, uh, it was actually the uh, suspension was initially a term-based, you can have a term-based uh, suspension, which is the equivalent of, of functional equivalent of snapback. You simply say, we're suspending the existing measures for one year, but they automatically come back in place after that term is up, or we can extend them for another year. So you could have a term listed, a term-based suspension, or you could have more generously an open-ended suspension, as was the case of Libya in 98. 
where they introduced an open-ended suspension uh, without a term limit to it. So there are different forms of, of suspensions that can be considered. Then, of course, as I've already mentioned, in the case of Afghanistan, you can have selective delistings. You could delist an individual, delist a key firm, delist a key family member. Uh, there are ways of, of sending signals through delistings and then finally lifting. And you can lift not all sanctions at once, but one sector after another and gradually move in a continuum. So there are all sorts of different types of sanctions relief. And now if we think about this typology and the situation in the Korean Peninsula, Think about the possibilities. You have many different types of relief, as I've just outlined, and you have many different types of sanctions, as I demonstrated in the previous slides. So in this case, there are so many possibilities, actually, for using sanctions relief in a, a calibrated tit-for-tat negotiation strategy. Many, many ways to link sanctions relief to denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. And this is a contrast to most UN sanctions regimes, because most regimes simply have a travel ban, asset freeze, maybe an arms embargo. And that doesn't give you very much to work with. But in the case of DPRK, there's a lot to work with, both in terms of the degree, the scope of the sanctions, but also the different types of relief that could be contemplated. You have most cases, as I say, in, in other cases, fewer sanctions in place, less room for linking to negotiation. So <clears throat> I want to conclude this with a, just a somewhat schematic, but a, a set of, it's not a, it's not a fully worked out plan, but it's, it's some thinking that we, I think, should engage in, uh, in ways of trying to think about stages of negotiation, uh, keeping the broader goal of, of denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula as, as the goal, and ultimately reunification, of course. Uh, but in fact, starting with, uh, and I'm, I'm here I'm based on, I'm making a reference to the International Crisis Group's report in 2018, where they laid out stages of negotiation. And what uh, my colleague David Lance from Swiss Peace and I have been doing is thinking about what types of sanctions relief could be linked to these different stages. So we, we credit them with the idea of the stages and the slides that are following, well, I'll, I'll present them now. First, what types of relief would be useful for creating a conducive environment? What would be useful next to launch formal negotiations? Not just the, the summary between, between, uh, between President Kim and and President Trump, but beyond that, formal ongoing negotiations. What would be required to produce an interim agreement? What would be required to produce a second agreement with IAEA inspections and, and the comprehensive uh, test ban treaty signing? Um, what would be necessary for a comprehensive final agreement? And then finally, the implementation of the agreement. So thinking about these six stages. So what I'll do just as, as a way of conclusion now is is go through each one of these and mention some ideas, just to put the ideas out there to get people thinking more creatively rather than just saying, ah, sanctions don't work, let's get rid of the sanctions. Um, no, let's actually think of creative ways of linking sanctions to denuclearization. So the first stage, and this is <clears throat> arguably where we are now. Um, there are things that have been done. There's a lot of, there are a lot of things being done privately, quietly in different forms of, of multi-track diplomacy. Uh, but there are gestures that could be taken to create a more conducive environment. I'm not going to say these will automatically work, but here are some ideas. Um, first, <clears throat> unilateral gestures on both sides. Um, DPRK has declared a moratorium. It's declared the moratorium over. It could redeclare its moratorium on nuclear and long-range missile testing. That would be a useful unilateral gesture. The U.S., um, as I mentioned earlier, could declare an end to the maximum pressure approach trying to force change with increased pressure, uh, saying we're going to back off from this. So there, there are ideas, you have some unilateral gestures on both sides, mostly just words, um, but words followed by actions, of course, are absolutely key. Second, <clears throat> I've already mentioned, facilitate emergency COVID-19 relief in, through any channels possible. Make sure uh, that DPRK doesn't uh, suffer unnecessarily um, and that it's... Um, able to get the kinds of supplies and equipment it needs to deal with with uh, what all countries are currently facing globally. Another gesture, create a safe banking channel for humanitarian actors. Simply say, all right, transactions through these banks for these actors, for these humanitarian purposes, are not going to be subject to restrictions, potential penalties, and fines. So create a safe banking channel for humanitarian actors working in the country. 
and uh, <clears throat> invite the DPRK to not be a member, not be a beneficiary, but to observe, participate in regional development bank meetings, get an idea of if, if, the, uh, if, if President Kim is so interested in, in development, um, look comparatively at what other countries within the region have done uh, comparatively in, in drawing on the resources of regional and other international bank resources. So invite them in as observer capacity. These are all gestures that could be taken to create an environment that's conducive for serious negotiations. Launching negotiations, I would argue, would take more dramatic first steps, particularly in terms of sanctions relief. Uh, the first thing would be to limit the application of US secondary sanctions just to go back to the 2006-12 period, the focus on nuclear and ballistic missile components, not the huge expansion after, after 2016 and 17, but focus on, on limiting the application of secondary sanctions, but apply them in cases of violation of the ban on nuclear and ballistic missile components. Scale back the export <clears throat> coal export restrictions. That would be significant in terms of revenue finances is, is a key concern, I believe, although I, I don't have a lot of detailed knowledge of the North Korean economy or thinking, but nonetheless, uh, this would be significant, I think, in terms of foreign exchange revenue. Increase the cap on petroleum export, exports and um, sort of imports into, into, uh, into North Korea. Uh, here, I'm just saying make a virtue out of necessity because neither China nor Russia are enforcing the existing cap anyway. So you might as well increase it. It doesn't cost you that much. Um, introduce some term limited, time limited suspensions of some of the sectoral measures. I believe this was put on the table in Stockholm last year by the US in the case of textiles, um, that there would be a suspension of the measures for a period. It could be a year, it could be 18 months, it could be two years. Um, offer some financial relaxation, because unless you have financing, you're not going to be able uh, to continue to, to carry on uh, the other types of imports and export activities. So some kinds of financial relaxation. And <clears throat> do what the US and the Europeans did at the outset in the case of the signing of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran. Offer public declarations of no new sanctions. The Obama administration did that. It wasn't able to carry it through to the Trump administration, but that's a different story. Nonetheless, again, public declaration of no new sanctions could be a way of launching formal negotiations. By the way, the further I get into this, the more it becomes um, sort of guesswork because these things would have to be done, as I said, step by step in a calibrated way. But reaching agreement uh, to consolidate a freeze on testing and sign of the Comprehensive Chest Ban Treaty um, you could begin by easing military contact restrictions. You could engage in selective delistings outside of the nuclear domain. You could uh, raise the caps again. You could introduce some additional time-limited suspensions. You could suspend the sport and cultural restrictions. So again, we've seen how effectively that was used uh, just a couple of years ago during the Olympics. Uh, you could suspend restrictions on DPRK receipt of international financial institution assistance for one year, possibly longer. So these are all ideas of rewarding uh, concessions, genuine uh, developments on denuclearization that, that could be traced. And then introduce multi-year infrastructure development plans, which of course South Korea would be eager to participate in, I'm sure, uh, if, if only the North were willing to allow it. Um, <clears throat> reaching an agreement on inspections, ratification of the CTBT, again, more suspensions, open-ended suspensions could be used to cover all the commodity restrictions. You could have selective termination of some sanctions. You could ban uh, the, the ban on sports culture, additional delistings, remove DPRK from the US sponsors of terrorism list. A lot of things that could be done at, at, at a later stage. With the signing of an agreement, complete delisting of the non-nuclear designations, convert the term-based suspensions to open-ended suspensions, terminate diplomatic and some sectoral sanctions. Now you're lifting finally and provide financial and technical assistance for conversion of nuclear because of course, North Korea has significant te technical knowledge of nuclear materials that now needs technical assistance for the conversion of weapons of potential mass destruction to uh, peaceful applications of nuclear power and energy. And that would require additional infrastructure development support. So in expanding 
educational exchange programs. Uh, so these are all things that could be done upon the signing of a comprehensive agreement. And once there's full implementation, then you can consider the termination, certainly all of the non-nuclear sanctions, schedule a date for the termination of the nuclear sanctions. That's exactly what was done in the JCPOA with Iran. Terminate the unilateral sanctions, sign a formal peace treaty, establish full diplomatic relations and reunification. Uh, these are, as I say, the further we go out, uh, the more <clears throat> this becomes, I don't want to say imaginary, but uh, it, would, it would have to follow some logic. But what I'm trying to lay out is, is a logic that suggests that if you go step by step, you could actually result in using the sanctions in this way, and I think in a constructive way to try to achieve a jointly shared goal uh, globally of, of the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So my conclusion is a, a coordinated and carefully calibrated tit for tat approach should be developed and constant adjustments will be needed. It's, it's not going to follow this very neat schema I've just laid out of step by step, but I'm just trying to think creatively about the varieties of the different types of sanctions relief and given the number of sanctions in place, the number of things that, that, that could be contemplated. And this would require substantial moves on all sides, I say both sides, but uh, I'm thinking of US and DPRK primarily, but also significant involvement from the Republic of Korea as well. Uh, and maximum pressure, as I said earlier, I believe has reached its limits. Uh, I, I think there are still advocates of this policy in Washington, um, but I, I, I do not uh, subscribe to their views. It's, it's actually akin to what a Norwegian scholar in the 1960s talking about Rhodesia uh, called the naive theory of sanctions. And the naive theory of sanctions this is Johan Galtung's classic work in world politics in 1967 when he said, the naive theory of sanctions is the more you ratchet up the pressure, eventually the other side will give and cave and give into all your demands. And he said, fundamentally, that's naive. And I agree. So the challenge really is when to offer sanctions relief, how extensive it should be, and what kind of timing, uh, how, how calibrated it should be as one proceeds. The political feasibility of this, the current moment may not be propitious for, for these proposals. I'm well aware of that. Um, there's significant political uncertainty in the US at the moment. So we don't know the outcome of the election yet. Uh, every, I think the whole world is, is watching uh, in this case and waiting for the outcome because I think it will be consequential uh, in a number of different ways. Um, there are, of course, also uncertainties about the DPRK's willingness to resume talks, uh, and in fact, the uh, the demolition of the of the uh, joint north south uh, building recently. I mean, this does not bode well for the idea of of willingness to engage in talking about uh, denuclearization again. But if we don't think these things through in advance, we won't be prepared if and when conditions on the ground change. And so, I guess on that. Uh, hopeful and, and somewhat optimistic note, I'll, I'll conclude. And thank you for your attention uh, in this presentation. So. Thank you very much for your comprehensive and creative uh, presentations. Actually, thank to you. save my time, uh, to save our session's time, uh, I'm gonna just wrap mm -hmm. up four points of your presentation. The first of all, okay. you explained the scale and the characteristics of international sanctions against North Korea through comparative perspective. In particular, you explained and uh, focus on the current scale of sanctions against North Korea by separating areas such as personal and non-economic sanctions. It also points out that uh, recent COVID-19 and natural disaster can cause unintended humanitarian issues such as food shortage and the wreck of medical supplies. Second point is uh, you made Unlike Iran, where U.S. sanctions were leading, the maximum pressure of the United States is limited because of the lack of consultation with Russia and China. The thirdly, you addressed that the sanction should always be designed with other policy measures, such as negotiation or mediation, which is most interesting point, uh, what I understand. The lastly, mm -hmm. the action suspensions or promotion of option can break deadlocks. Libya in 1990s, Yugoslavia and Afghanistan model can be expected of this argument. To extend with this argument, North Korea case should also be designed with bilateral or multilateral negotiation or mediation. 
this is uh, kind of eight points what I understood from your presentation. Uh, to continue with this uh, summary, I would like to raise some questions to your presentation. The sure. first question is, <laughs> The recently, the Trump administration preferred bilateral negotiation with North Korea. Uh, this is what we called is top-down approach rather than multilateral uh, approach. But on the other <coughs> hand, the Biden <coughs> administration is expected to prefer multilateral negotiation with North Korea based on the U.S. sanctions against North Korea. What type of negotiation do you think will be more conducive in resolving the issue of denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, along with the current UN sanctions against North Korea? Uh, yeah. Oh, thank. Oh, should, shall I answer right away, or do you want to pose other, other questions? Uh, probably to save time, I'm going to give you more questions, and okay. then you can just okay, uh, answer perfect. to my question. Okay. My second right. question is the Trump administration has withdrawn from the joint comprehensive plan of actions and Iranian denuclearization deals. European negotiators like uh, France and Germany, however, declared they would maintain the action plan with Iran. Can this negotiation be successful without the participation of the United States? How does the professor force this denuclearization negotiation in Iran? And uh, how do you think the case of Iran will affect North Korea's denuclearization negotiation in the future? This is kind of a perspective issues. The last question I would like to raise is, you argued sanctions relief would have an effect on North Korea's denuclearization. The United States and North Korea need mutual concessions to lift the UN sanctions, from my understanding. So the main focus of the last round of negotiation was to negotiate the inspection of North Korea's Yongbyon base and the lifting of sanction against North Korea. Probably sanction relief w from your understanding. To include a snapback policy, if you suggest any examples uh, from past experience, which one is kind of a example to North Korea denuclearization issues. Thank you. This is my uh, three questions to your presentation. Thanks. Thanks very much. Those are good, those are good questions and a uh, nice follow-on. I also appreciate very much your summary of the main points, so mm -hmm. I, I, I appreciate that as well. Uh, <clears throat> first, I think uh, I talked about the uncertainty at the very, very end uh, about where the U.S. is, is going at this point in time. Uh, I would anticipate that a Biden administration would be significantly more multilateral in its approach. And that's uh, across the board. Uh, I think there would be efforts um, uh, somewhat parallel to, uh, to what the Obama administration did with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. In that period, it's quite significant. It's not just, even, even though a lot of it boiled down to the US and Iran. I, I've talked to people who participated in the, in the discussions some of which were held here in, in Geneva. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's um, so the main, there, that was the main bilateral dynamic, US-Iran. But the US worked very closely with getting Europe on board before it reached the initial agreement in 2013, which mm -hmm. led eventually to the 2015 JCPOA. Uh, so I think uh, there would be a strong tendency to think multilaterally and uh, any realist would, would look at the situation today and say, look, uh, <clears throat> China and Russia are already introducing a resolution on their own uh, calling, I think somewhat naively, I might say, uh, for, um, for sanctions relief um, without any kind of concessions on the other side. That's a different, different matter, but uh, some kind of multilateral engagement to return to the six party talks in some form, I would anticipate that. Mm -hmm. um, as as an alternative, if Trump is reelected, well, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, <clears throat> that's I don't want to be too excessively political about this. I think the whole world is waiting, in a sense. Um, now, I will give I will give Trump credit for just one thing, perhaps, and that is audacity. 
the willingness to go because I'm, mm. I'm sure the overwhelming advisors internally in the U.S. government were opposed to the idea of sitting down one on one uh, with with Kim and and starting. Uh, but I, I think that kind of audacity and, and uh, thinking outside of the, the box of, of, uh, of Washington um, had its its moment, uh, had its creativity, had its uh, as I say audacity. Um, but I think what had to be built underneath it uh, on both sides mm -hmm. is is technical discussions because you don't begin with the summit you you end with a summit once all the details have been worked out and you mm -hmm. declare victory uh, so in that sense it was a very very risky mm -hmm. strategy but it at least uh, created some fresh thinking and and I think did uh, create the possibility that we could be talking about this in, in a serious way so in that sense I'll give them credit but uh, where they would go in the future with this um, it's hard to say um, it's potential. I mean, I, I don't want to speculate too much about that, but let me just make the main point about the multilateral, bilateral difference uh, uh, between the, the approaches that would take place. Um, with regard to the JCPOA, um, can it continue without the US? Um, the answer is probably no. And again, this links to your first question. A Biden administration, they've already indicated they would go back to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Uh, <clears throat> how this would affect DPRK, I would hope it would be seeing the potential because what I've outlined isn't mm -hmm. directly linked to the JCPOA. That was a single agreement that that included all of these gestures of we'll relieve this if you open to inspections. Uh, once you've uh, reduced uh, enrichment to a certain level, we'll, we'll, that was all written out in, in this 100, what, 120 page document. Um, what I'm suggesting in the DPRK case is step by step by in, in terms of negotiation, this, this tit for tat calibrated approach. Um, but it's really modeled after the JCPOA. I mean, all the elements of the JCPOA are, are really part of it. And that's, I think, drawing on the ICG report as well with these different stages. So um, if it if the JCPOA could get back on track, and it's really the question of, of can the US, it's, it's a global question. I hear it in Europe all the time. Um, can the U.S. be trusted? Um, is its word <laughs> good for a period of time, or will it simply change when there's an administration change? And this is, uh, in that sense, the Trump administration, I would argue, has been disastrous for U.S. standing in the world and for its uh, for the trustworthiness of the U.S. word on things. So this, um, but I think it it could have a positive effect if, in fact, it could get back on on track. And with regard to snapback, well, <clears throat> I actually think here's an argument I, I haven't made publicly to the Europeans, I should make more uh, <laughs> to my colleagues in, in Brussels and elsewhere. But that's the idea that, um, one, there's of course the question. I, I, think, I, I think the analysis largely is that uh, Europe is, is shrugging. Uh, it's a French kind of shrug, okay, that's what the US says, but the US is, has withdrawn from the agreement. So it really doesn't have the right to trigger snapback. And it's a, this is going to be caught, and we'll see whether or not it's actually taken seriously. Um, I, I would argue that if you look at the details of the JCPOA, particularly with regard to, to snapback, uh, there's a stage the US has skipped. And I'm surprised Europe hasn't focused more on this because before you get to the declaration of snapback, you should go through a dispute resolution mechanism. Mm -hmm. And it's all laid out in the JCPOA. The US hasn't taken advantage of that dispute resolution mechanism, which even involves a, a mediated agreement between the US and Iran if there's a strong disagreement. So by skipping that stage, I don't think you can invoke snapback. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an argument that should be made. Uh, so I don't think it's actually a legitimate move to, to challenge to say they're gonna do snapback. And examples of, of when it's worked in the past, actually, um, I would argue that a term limited suspension of a sanction is the functional equivalent of snapback. Because what you're saying is you agree to suspend the measure for a limited period of time. Mm -hmm. But at the end of that, and the UN has done this in, in cases in the past where it's applied term limited suspensions, uh, the, the conflict party, I think it was a case of Liberia, uh, did not uh, agree to change their behavior and the sanctions went back in place. So you can have snapback. We have examples of this historically. You don't need to negotiate the dispute resolution mechanism or create this exit. But of course, in the case of Iran, it was very sensitive and it had to be negotiated uh, very closely and, and uh, 
there was there was a lot of the question of whether or not Congress would go along with the agreement, and so that's why it was it was constructed in the agreement as it was. But I think we already have examples of uh, of practices in the past where uh, suspensions, time limited suspensions, have proven to be not only um, effective, but snapback has actually been applied in some cases. So we have some of the tools already. We don't need to to uh, create a huge new uh, architecture to, mm. to to utilize those tools. Thank you very much for your answer. Um, actually, uh, before I have uh, your presentation, we, I think you're probably, I think the first line of your presentation, nobody likes sanctions. So many Korean right. on the yeah many Korean on the uh, the Korean uh, Korean Peninsula, we just understand the international sanction against North Korea can probably cause uncertainty. So, but uh, after your presentation and your analyze on international sanctions against North Korea with other policies, uh, provide a very uh, creative uh, ideas. So in these sessions, we have discussed how to adopt international sanctions in North Korea for denuclearization and peace on the Korean Peninsula with Professor Bill Stecker. Uh, as, a, as a scholar, it was a fascinating time for me, and I've learned a lot of things about the effect of diverse UN sanctions and the effectiveness of conditions about uh, international sanctions. So Professor Thomas Bierstecker, I really appreciate with your insightful presentation and discussions. Uh, thank you for listening. I mean, the, the audience who've been watching this film. And uh, please stay well from COVID-19 and enjoy your vacation. You as well. Thanks to you as well. Thank you very much for inviting me to present. And I wish you all the best uh, for the remainder of your conference. So thank you. Thank you.